Hello and welcome to the second lecture for topic six and in this we're going to be taking a look at abortion policy. Today abortion is an incredibly heated uh, political topic and I think we're all aware of that particularly after the decision in Dobbs. Um, but Keep in mind, this has not always been the case. Um, you know, this battle be between pro-life and pro-choice and battles over who's going to sit on the Supreme Court in order to assure that pro Roe v. Wade stays the law of the land versus to overturning Roe v. Wade, political parties sort of identifying as pro-life or pro-choice. That has not always been the case in American history. It's really not until the mid part of the 20th century that, um, you know, that uh, abortion becomes this politically salient issue. And it says there until the mid part of the 20th century, it, w it really wasn't a big part of politics. Um, that all changes it after the Roe v. Wade, which we're going to talk about in today's class. Um, after the, the decision Roe v. Wade saying that people have a constitutional right to an abortion, um, it, it really begins to draw uh, lines in the sand. You get a big backlash for, uh, from the conservative uh, Christian right in the United States, very angry about the decision in Roe v. Wade, and a pushback from the Democrats uh, to, um, you know, fight for protecting those rights. So today, it's a, it's, it's a very heated uh, 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 issue, and it continues to be uh, heated uh, anew with the, de the decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, the case that overturns Roe v. Wade, which we'll also be talking about today. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the textbook has phases of abortion policy, just as they had the phases for contraceptive policy. And you're going to see that the phases of abortion policy really mirror the phases of contraceptive policy. Uh, phase one is that abortion is uh, deemed a private uh, matter, and it really does not enter into the public realm. And so that is the case from the colonial era uh, in the United States up until the 1830s. So you can sort of see that's exactly what was happening with contraceptive um, policy. Phase two is that abortion becomes a public matter, and we'll talk about why an abortion is criminalized, much like contraceptives are criminalized as well. And that goes from the 1830s until 1973 with um, the decision in Roe v. Wade. Phase three is that abortion is constitutionally protected coming out of Roe v. Wade, but with limitations and growing limitations. Uh, and that takes place from 1973 until today, uh, uh, 2022. And the we're in the fourth phase now um, that uh, due to the decision in Dobbs, there is no longer a constitutional right to an abortion, and the decision is left to the states to decide what that uh, abortion policy is going to be. And so that's an overview of each of the phases. Let's go in and look at more detail at each of these phases. So phase one of abortion policy is that abortion is a private and largely unregulated manner. So prior to the 1830s, abortion was mostly legal, it was viewed as a private practice, and it was generally unregulated by the state. Um, and so very similar to the approaches that the policy approaches uh, of contraception at this time period as well. Uh, that women would share with each other through their midwives and through the other women that they would know in their community, uh, that they would share pamphlets that would be handed down from mother to daughter uh, that were basically home medical guides that would tell you what kind of herbs that you should grow in your garden and that if you um, if you stop having your period, that there are certain um, herbal sort of elixirs that you can make and consume in order to bring on your period, to bring on the menses with herbs. And so, you know, initially, you know, the idea of pregnancy, it wasn't really thought about in the same way. It was that there was really different attitudes about um, when somebody stopped having their period and when attitudes would change about not having your period or not menstruating, that there was a different attitude between pre-quickening um, pregnancy and post-pregnancy quickening pregnancy. So quickening is that um, that time when uh, an individual can feel a fetal movement within their body. And so prior to quickening that, uh, uh, you know, bringing on mense menses, you know, using herbal elixirs to, you know, uh, terminate the pregnancy, but really it was thought about just 
bringing on back your menstrual cycle, it was it was seen as a very common procedure and it was just viewed as a part of life. Attitudes were different at post quickening. And so that if there was a fetal death after fetal movement, then um, that kind of activity was um, seen as a more serious action. I mean, prior to quickening, it wasn't seen as, an, uh, you know, any sort of criminal or immoral act but so prior to quickening but after quickening there was more concern from the state at that point uh, but it wasn't uh you know laws that were embedded within state statutes right it's not like the state legislature got together and said that um that we're going to pass a law that makes it a felony uh if you if you you know uh, kill a post quick baby uh that mostly was common law and and it was custom it wasn't uh embedded in state statutes it wasn't a statutory policy that was in place. And so common law is basically that if there's a behavior that seems that it's outside of the norm of the community, uh, then that behavior would be punished, it would be regulated, but that punishment would come forth through the customs of that community um, and also the court rulings, what judges have said about um, people who have engaged in that 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 uh, behavior in the past, how are they punished in the past, and that they would use that as a guide for punishing that action that was taking place in the in the um, in the present. Uh, and you know, for the most part, it, it was rarely enforced, right? And so, even if there was a death of a post quick uh, fetus, that it was oftentimes not pursued um, by the courts. So, phase one, abortion, private and a generally unregulated matter. Starting in the 1830s, we see a shift to the second phase in abortion policy. And that phase is that abortion, it becomes a matter of public concern and a move towards total criminalization of abortion. So in the 1830s, we see a shift towards criminalizing, criminalizing abortion at all stages. In other words, that terminating a pregnancy at any stage should be considered a crime. So why? Why the shift from sort of uh, a saying that before quickening that it's a private matter and after quickening it's a public matter, but it's not something that should be like, you know, like, you know, embedded in, in state or federal law. Well, what's with this shift? Well, a lot of the shift has to do with a, a growing societal awareness of the harms associated with abortion. So let's take a look at what some of those harms were. So what were some of the concerns that led to the rise of the criminalization of abortion? Oh, well, one of the concerns was regarding the harm of the unlicensed practitioners. This is a time period, and as I mentioned before, that we see a rise of the professional class of physicians and the power that the American Medical Association has within our society. And in many ways, this is a good thing, right? Um, that that uh, people who are not licensed to practice medicine, uh, you know, can engage in a harmful practices. Uh, and so that there, and th at this time, there were many people who were engaging in abortions and pr uh, advertising for abortions and using, uh, you know, horrible poisons to commit abortions uh, that w were resulting in great harm to women. And so the AMA, uh, you know, fought, wanted to uh, criminalize abortions, uh, particularly for those who were, didn't, were not, uh, did not have a license to practice uh, medicine. Some of the concerns that the, uh, about the about the harm of unlicensed practitioners was a little bit less legitimate. Uh, you know, up until this point, women were the ones who were responsible for the most part for taking care of the reproductive health of other women. Midwives played a role in in both the birthing of children and also in uh, you know guiding women to about bringing about their menses. Uh, and so, you know, this basically criminalized uh, the actions of midwives as per, in particular as it relates to. Uh, uh, terminating a pregnancy before quickening because midwives are unlicensed practitioners and of course they're unlicensed practitioners because the vast majority of women were not able to attend medical school. Uh, there were concerns with the uh, uh, concerns regarding the harm to the unborn to the fetus uh, that at this time that there was advanced advancing knowledge in terms of fetal development and so attitudes about treatment of fetuses changed and that was captured by the move towards criminalization and also there was concerns regarding the harm that abortion has um, to women in general and many feminists were uh, uh, opposed to abortion 
Uh, and they actually welcomed the criminalization that began taking place in the 1830s. Um, and that might sound sort of surprising to you. We think about feminists today as being, you know, pro-choice for the most part. Now, let, let's be clear. Many feminists were pro-birth control, right? It's sort of like pro, like Margaret Sanger was pro-birth control. She was a feminist, but she was anti-abortion. She was like, abortions can be really damaging to women. And so let's pre prevent pregnancy before they take place. So, uh, you know, feminists sort of saw uh, and they were a poor, uh, a supportive of criminalizing abortion uh, because they, they saw uh, pregnancy and abortions, uh, uh, pregnancies that resulted in abortions as sort of a double victimization of women. On the one hand, they viewed women as being a victim of the sexual demands of their husbands, right? That, um, that men, you know, wanted to have sex, women, you know, were not able to resist uh, 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 their husband's uh, sexual um, uh, advances. In fact, it was legal to rape your wife at this time period. And so they viewed them, uh, women as victims of that, that, you know, men got the sex and the pleasure, but women were left with the pregnancy. And then they saw women as further victimized because as they sought to terminate their pregnancy, uh, that they were subject to unregulated practices that were very dangerous for women. And so there was, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a groundswell uh, regarding the harms associated with abortion that led to this phase of criminalization of, of, of abortion. So the Wisconsin 1848 abortion law is a really good example of the types of abortion laws that states enacted in the 1830s in the United States. <laughs> to be quite frank with you, my head is kind of exploding, right? Because when I've, I've taught this in the past, I use this as an example of policy at, for, at, from phase two, but not the policy for today. But as we know that with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, this is the law that's the law of the land in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and as it says there, it's a good example of the types of laws that were enacted at this time period. Who would have thought it would be the, the, the law that's still in force today? Um, the the uh, 1848 abortion law in Wisconsin, uh, it, it, it says that it's a class H felony for anyone other than the mother to intentionally destroy the life of an unborn child. An unborn child is defined as uh, uh, that starts at conception. OK, uh, that the maximum penalty is six years in prison and a ten thousand dollar fine if you uh, engage in an intentionally destroying the life of an unborn child. Uh, there are uh, there is an exception in this law, but it is a very, um, uh, you know, small exception that uh, there's an exception for what's known as uh, medically necessary abortion to save the life of, of the mother. Uh, all other abortions are criminalized. This is a good example of the types of um, abortion laws that were put in place in many states throughout the United States, uh, starting in the 1830s, because it focuses on the practitioner, not the pregnant person, okay? So if a, if a pregnant person, if the mother destroys the fetus and the, the unborn child, uh, they're not going, they're, they're, it, that's not a crime. The crime is placed on the person the, the practitioner, uh, somebody other than the mother who um, uh, 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 destroys the life of an unborn child. Uh, it's a stiff punishment, so there's a lot of deterrence here uh, that this sends a message to uh, doctors and others that if you engage in this practice and you get caught, you're going to go to jail for some significant time. It does provide a very limited exception uh, for so-called therapeutic abortions, and, and, and therapeutic abortion is just an, an archaic came term for an abortion that's necessary to save the life of the mother. So a good example of phase two abortion policy. So by the 1950s, it's very difficult to obtain an abortion in the United States. Most states uh, enact laws that are very similar to the law in Wisconsin. Uh, and that obtaining a doctor approved abortion was incredibly uh, difficult uh, because of the fear of criminal penalties. OK, uh, and so uh, if, uh, the, the abortion policy in the United States was very restrictive. 
it almost goes without saying what the impact of that restrictive abortion policy is. Um, you know, women still get abortions, but uh, it's very unregulated, dangerous conditions. Um, uh, women would wait to get abortions. And the longer you wait in your pregnancy to get an abortion, the more dangerous it becomes. Uh, and that because of both the unregulation and waiting a, a, you know, a, a long time to get a, an abortion, that there's a high injury uh, and, and risk of, of death. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the uh, abortion policy, a restrictive abortion policy has a, a significant impact on the, li on the lives of women and society in general. In the 1960s, we begin to see a change in attitudes on abortion. And this change in attitudes on abortion uh, begins to pave the way towards um, a changing abortion policy. Uh, that second wave feminists come to you know the forefront at this time period, and they began linking abortion rights to uh, the issue of um, uh, equality for women, and that there's a demand for uh, the repeal of all abortion laws in the United States. Uh, that there's a rising concern regarding class and race inequities in abortion access. If you're if you have money, and oftentimes income level is you know linked to race because we have systemic uh, racial wealth inequalities in the United States, um, that it's easier for a white, uh, wealthier person to get an abortion. And it's much more difficult for a person of color or of lower economic means to get an abortion. So you sort of have these two tiers of abortion access that are, are developing. Uh, and also that in, in the 1950s and 60s, there was the use, use of a... Um, a sedative called uh, thalidomide that resulted in um, significant birth defects to, to children. And so if pregnant women were given this drug during a pregnancy, that, that oftentimes it would um, result in um, not the death of a fetus, but a fetal abnormality to a fetus. And I remember specifically when I was growing up, and like I said, I was born in 1964, and I was raised Catholic, and I remember we went to church, and there was a young boy who was sitting in front of me and um, with uh, the really grave um, uh, abnormalities, uh, physical abnormalities. And I remember my parents saying, and they knew the woman, uh, his mom, and said that the fetal, uh, that the, the physical uh, uh, abnormalities were due to the use of that drug. And so people saw, you know, the impact of, uh, of this on uh, fetal development. And it sort of changed people's attitude that maybe there are times short of uh, threatened thre threats to the life of, of the mother or the pregnant person, you know, maybe there are times where people should be given um, that option to terminate a pregnancy, particularly if it involved um, grave fetal abnormalities. So this is a map of abortion policy in the United States um, just prior to the decision in Roe v. Wade that says that you have a constitutional right to an abortion. Um, and, you know, you see that that um, that what we were talking about in the last slide, that there was um, you know, sort of a, a growing movement to um, make abortion laws less restrictive. We see that reflected in this map. Uh, and so there's three colors of states on this map. There are the states that are in white, there are the states that are in gray, and then there are the states that are in, in black, okay? Now, the white states, and you can see here, Wisconsin is a white state, um, that up until Roe v. Wade, these are the states that had an abortion policy very similar to, to Wisconsin, um, that uh, abortion was criminalized and that uh, the only non-criminal abortion was one that was performed by a licensed doctor and it was performed um, because the life of the pregnant person or woman was in jeopardy. Uh, and, and you can see that the vast majority of states in the United States have that on the books. However, you do see a growing, the gray states are the states that are uh, allow for additional exceptions to the law. And so in Wisconsin and the white states, you only have one exception that you can only get an abortion if you're if a woman and the pregnant person's life is in jeopardy. Uh, the gray states are uh, the states that uh, that allow for other exceptions such as exceptions for in the case of rape, incest, or fetal abnormality. Uh, and then you have four states, uh, New York, Washington, Air, Ar Ar 
Alaska and Hawaii, uh, they have um, uh, liberal laws, okay? And so these are the laws that allow abortion uh, basically on demand uh, throughout the course of the pregnancy, um, you know, dependent on on the, the guidance of a woman and her family and, 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 uh, and the doctor, okay? So this is what the map looks like prior to Roe v. Wade. Abortion policy changes significantly in 1973 with the decision uh, in Roe v. Wade that provides a constitutional right to obtain an abortion. And that ushers in phase three of, of abortion policy. That is that abortion is constitutionally protected, but with limits. So relating you know, back to Griswold versus Connecticut, remember that that is the case that establishes the right to privacy as it relates to using contraceptives. The state can't interfere with the marital privacy and that it gets expanded to the privacy of all individuals um, that, uh, uh, regarding the use of contraceptives. The question is, is does that right to privacy extend to abortions? That's the question that's asked in Roe v. Wade and answered, and the answer to that question is yes. So let's take a look at quickly at the facts of Roe v. Wade. So it goes without saying Roe v. Wade is, an, is a very important case, and it's a case that most people in the United States and beyond are, are, know about. Um, and so it, it is this landmark case, but whenever I teach Roe v. Wade, I'm reminded of how every case that comes to the Supreme Court is really uh, deals with the lives of, of real people and how laws have impacted the lives uh, of people, just regular people, right? And um, Jane Roe, um, her real name was Nora McCorvey. Um, sometimes or often uh, court cases will use a pseudonym for people, particularly when it deals with a sensitive issue like abortion. And so um, Roe was used, but her name was Norma McCorvey. And she is shown here in the photograph here uh, in, uh, in, in 1989 and here later in 2008 um, uh, that she goes from an individual who is a pro-choice, pro pro-abortion rights, to later in life to an individual who is pro-life. Um, and, and Norma McCorvey, she, um, her life was difficult, um, that she lived in Texas, she was poor, um, she was a carnival worker, and uh, that she, in, in 1970, uh, she realized that she was pregnant uh, with her third uh, third uh, child um, and that she wanted to have an abortion. She just didn't think that given her life circumstances um, that she could um, con that she could have another child. Uh, so she lived in Texas and Texas had a law in the books just like Wisconsin. Texas law said that you could only have the, uh, an abortion. It, 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 the only exception was if your life was in jeopardy and, and Norma McCorvey's life was not in jeopardy. Uh, she even told her doctor that she had been raped and that hoping that the doctor would, um, you know, uh, take take pity on her and, and and perform an abortion that would would have been illegal because there was no exception for rape in in Texas as there isn't in Wisconsin, and and the doctor uh, did not perform the ab abortion and Norma McCorvey was not raped. I mean, she was just desperate because of of her circumstances. Um, she ended up, you know, uh, giving birth and putting the child up for adoption. Um, but that uh, a, a couple of lawyers, um, uh, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, um, learned about her case and that they helped Norma McCorvey take the case to the Supreme Court, uh, basically arguing that the Texas law was unconstitutional uh, because it deprived women of the fundamental right of privacy, the fundamental right to control the autonomy of their body, and the fundamental right to make decisions about their reproductive life. And, and so they brought the case worked its way up to the Supreme Court, um, uh, making the argument regarding the constitutionality of abortion rights. So the question in Roe v. Wade before the court is pretty straightforward. The question before the court is, is abortion a fundamental right under the privacy set out in Griswold versus Connecticut? And the Supreme Court said yes. In a seven to two decision, um, the court said that yes, uh, abortion is a fundamental constitutional right. So let's look at the decision in Roe v. Wade uh, a little bit more closely. 
So the decision of the, of the court basically says that the right to privacy that is established in Griswold extends to the right to have an abortion. So the right to privacy includes the right to choose to have an abortion. If you recall, and this is a little bit in the weeds, I teach civil liberties, so sorry if I'm getting off a little bit in the weeds here. But if you remember, the right to privacy in Griswold was found in the penumbras of the Bill of Rights. And so it was like, hey, and the words right to privacy, that is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. You know, uh, other uh, other liberties like the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law abridging your freedom of speech, right? The language is right there. But there's nothing that says Congress shall make no law abridging your right to privacy. That is not in the Constitution. And so in Griswold, it was found in putting together different parts of the Bill of Rights. Took a little bit from the first, the right to associate. Took a little bit from the third, which is saying the government can't put things in your house like soldiers. Took from the fourth that said you had a right to be free from un unreasonable search and seizure. Took from the fifth that said you have a right to remain silent. And took from the ninth that basically said just because a, a liberty is not enumerated in the Constitution doesn't mean that it's not in the Constitution. And so Griswold followed, found that right to privacy in the penumbras, the shadows of the of the Bill of Rights. Uh, in in uh, in Roe v. Wade, they found it in a different place. They found it in the Fourteenth Amendment Due Process Clause, and that's where the right to privacy has been ever since until Dobbs, where they said that the right to privacy as it relates to abortion cannot be found in the due process clause. What the due process clause says is that government can't take away your life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. And so that, that word liberty, which means freedom, um, that that word liberty has been used to expand uh, the rights, basically saying that, you know, you have rights that aren't explicitly enumerated in the Constitution, but they are implied rights and freedoms and liberties that come from the Due Process Clause. Uh, and so uh, that that is where the right to privacy has, was seated in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, and that's where it's remained ever since. And so that reproductive freedom includes abortion, and it's one of these, these liberties. Uh, what's interesting about the, Ro the Roe v. Wade decision is it's not like, uh, it's not saying that a, a person has a right to an abortion at any point in their pregnancy. They, um, they, they, they create this thing called the trimester framework. And that basically it says that there's three trimesters, right, in a pregnancy. Uh, and that early in the pregnancy and the before viability, the government cannot criminalize abortion, okay? And so the trimester framework says that uh, it, uh, prior to viability, which is about 22, 23 weeks, um, that, uh, that the state cannot criminalize abortion. However, as the pregnancy progresses and gets closer to uh, birth, uh, that the state's uh, uh, interest increases, okay? And so that the state's interest in um, preserving life both the life of the mother, because late term abortions are more dangerous than early term abortions are very safe. Um, and also that, you know, that uh, the later you are in, in, in your pregnancy, the more um, viable the fetus is. And, and so the state has a, an interest in protecting that. And so the trimester framework says that early in the, in the pregnancy, government can't criminalize it. But as the pre pregnancy progresses, the state can increase its regulations, even to the point of criminalizing of abortions in the very late terms. So following Roe v. Wade, state laws that were on the books that criminalized abortion prior to fetal vi viability, those were nullified by the, by the decision in Roe. So those were basically viewed as unconstitutional laws. So for example, the Wisconsin law from 1848, that was nullified, found to be unconstitutional by Roe. And at this point, you know, abortion becomes a, a defining political issue. We see the rise of the pro-life movement started this time. A lot of uh, people in the pro-life movement are very angry about the decision in, in, that was made in Roe v. Wade. And so a long-term strategy starts with the pro-life movement in the United States. And the long-term strategy is that um, to overturn Roe v. Wade, okay? So that's what the long-term goal is of the pro-life movement. 
the short-term goal is to whittle away at Roe, ro, okay? So the long-term goal, goal is vacate Roe, get it, have it be overturned by the courts. Uh, but in the meantime, kind of whittle away at Roe. And so the way you whittle away at Roe from the pro-life movement's perspective was to elect pro-life politicians that were willing to enact uh, restrictive abortion laws through in the states, throughout the United States. Um, it, 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 these restrictive abortion laws will make it more um, difficult for people to um, to get an abortion. So it serves the goal of reducing the amount of abortions that people can receive. Um, and, you know, it, 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 and it sort of sets the stage for, you know, people challenging these laws, basically saying that these laws are violation of a constitutional right. Um, it also, you know, if people think that the law is a violation of the constitutional right, it sets the stage for a case to be brought to the Supreme Court. And the only way that Roe can be overturned if, it's, if a case is brought to the Supreme Court, where the question is re-asked, is abortion a constitutional right? And they're hoping that a court will find will answer differently than they answered in Roe, say, no, abortion is not a constitutional right. Another strategy is to elect pro-life presidents, presidents who are willing to appoint pro-life judges, judges that are willing to overturn Roe, um, and to seat those uh, judges both on the lower federal courts and then ultimately on the Supreme Court. And, and as we found out in 2022, the pro-life movement has been successful on all of these counts. So following Roe, some states begin enacting laws that are interfere with abortion access. Um, uh, states begin passing laws that are instituting uh, waiting periods so that you have to wait 24 hours, 48 hours to, you know, get an abortion. You go in for a consultation, then you have to come home, go home and, and come back in 24 or 48 hours. Um, informed consent where people are, you know, shown pamphlets about fetal development, a sonograms, parental consent. So uh, many states in the United States began to um, enact the laws that place restrictions in a, uh, on abortion and interfere with abortion access. And as was sort of the plan that these laws are challenged because many feel that these laws that are interfering with abortion access, particularly prior to the viability of the fetus, that that's an impingement upon the constitutional right to an abortion that was established in Roe v. Wade. The question comes to that the court and Planned Parenthood of Southern Pennsylvania v. Casey or also just known as Casey. And uh, this this is uh, a case that comes to the Supreme Court in 1992. And in 1992, a lot of people felt that Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned in this case. Um, you know, this case was about those, uh, Pennsylvania had put a bunch of laws in place, the waiting periods, the parental consent, um, the informed consent, etc. cetera. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that people challenged those laws uh, and brought the question of the court asking whether or not these laws were unconstitutional. And so even though people thought that Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned in 1992 in Casey, that's not what happened. It was sort of a mixed decision. On the one side, the constitutional right to an abortion prior to viability is affirmed. In other words, Roe is not overturned in Casey. However, the regulatory laws were deemed to be constitutional. Uh, they basically said that regulatory laws, such as waiting periods, et cetera, are only unconstitutional if it places a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion before viability. That's known as the undue burden test. And what the Supreme Court said was these regulatory laws, the waiting periods, the informed consent, that those did not present an undue burden. So if states wanted to pass these regulatory laws regulating um, uh, abortion prior to viability, those kinds of laws were deemed constitutional in the decision in Casey. So even though for the pro-life movement um, that it was somewhat of a loss because Roe was not overturned, it does sort of open the, um, uh, gives a green light to states that want to uh, enact restrictive abortion laws basically gives them the go ahead. And, and so states follow suit. 
following Casey's state's expanded restrictions on abortion and expanded restrictions on abortion beyond waiting periods and informed consent, but began um, restricting abortion uh, prior to vi viability. Um, and so viability is generally at uh, 24 weeks. Roe says that you have a constitutional right to an abortion prior to viability, uh, but states began to enact laws that placed, um, you know, basically prohibiting abortion after 20 weeks. That was the law in Wisconsin prior to do the Dobbs decision. Uh, in Texas, as we saw, it was the heartbeat law, right? That basically said that once there is a fetal heart activity around six weeks, then the state bans abortions after after that point. And 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 so these laws, uh, you know, the that that are placing uh, restrictions or prohibiting abortion prior to viability, those laws are enacted uh, because they're designed to bring the case to the Supreme Court. So Roe wasn't overturned in 1992. The uh, activities still to take place, take place to continue passing restrictive laws with the hopes that this question will work its way back to the Supreme Court. Um, and so it, Roe wasn't overturned in Casey in 92, but maybe the current court will, is the thinking. And and the, the court, the makeup of the court in 2022 is profoundly different than the makeup of the court in 1973 and in 1992, the court that heard Casey and reaffirmed Roe. Um, President Trump, uh, places three new justices on the Supreme Court. One justice, uh, he replaces uh, Antonin Scalia, who was pro-life, and so he replaced uh, Scalia with a pro-life judge, so there was no change there. However, he also replaces Anthony Kennedy uh, with Brett Kavanaugh, and Anthony Kennedy was a, a pro-choice uh, judge. He affirmed the uh, 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 the uh, Roe and Casey, and then uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg too. She dies and she's replaced with um, uh, Amy uh, Coney Barrett, who is um, a pro-life uh, Supreme Court justice. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, everything kind of comes together where we have states that are placing prohibiting abortions prior to viability and a Supreme Court that is likely to overturn Roe. And as we all know, the Supreme Court did overturn Roe. So the case that overturns Roe v. Wade and also the decision in Casey as well is, a, is a, the famous case that we're all aware of, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And it was decided uh, with, you know, within the last six months in 2022. Uh, this case has to do with a, uh, a law in Mississippi. So in 2018, uh, Mississippi passed a law called the Gestational Age Act. And this uh, law uh, prohibits all abortions with few exceptions after 15 weeks. So if you uh, that if you seek an abortion after 15 weeks, the state says it prohibits them. You cannot get an abortion after 15 weeks. And so the question was, is this law uh, 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 unconstitutional, right? I mean, it clearly, since Roe says that you have a right to an, a fundamental constitutional right to an abortion uh, prior to viability, viability being 24 weeks, it's clear that this 15 week ban, if Roe is the law of the land, is unconstitutional. But that's not how the Supreme Court ruled. In a 6 3 decision, uh, they ruled that the Mississippi law is not unconstitutional. Um, that, and the opinion is written by. Uh, Justice uh, Samuel Alito. And he basically says that the Constitution does not confer a right to an abortion, effectively overturning Roe and Casey. Uh, he also says that, you know, the, the reasoning is, is that abortion's not mentioned in the Constitution. No surprise there, given that the Constitution was written by men and women were not recognized as legal participants in our democracy. But he says that abortion is not mentioned in the Constitution, and this is a right that is not deeply rooted in U.S. history. Uh, and so, uh, and he concludes that, that the right to an abortion is not a fundamental liberty, as was stated in Roe v. Wade. So what does the decision in Dobbs mean for abortion policy in the United States? Well, as it says there, that it, we're in phase four, that there's no constitutional right to an abortion, and the decision is, for all practical purposes, left to the states. And so post Dobbs, the United States has really re returned to a pre-Roe status, and your, a person's ability to access and, 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 and have 
uh, 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 reproductive freedoms uh, really depends on the state you live in and, and really the state that you live near. And it uh, obviously opens up broad inequalities to abortion access, not just the broad inequalities associated with a state by state patchwork approach, but again, as it was in a pre row era, that if you know, for those who had money and had the ability to travel where they wanted to travel to get an abortion, well, they're still going to have abortion access. But for others who are less wealthy and not less able to do that travel for a variety of reasons, whether that's mon for money reasons or just because of family reasons, um, access to abortion is going to be much more difficult. And so this is what we're looking at in terms of abortion policy in the United States post Dobbs. Um, these are the states where that uh, that the state in dark red either has a full ban or uh, a partial ban. OK, and so you'll see that 13 states here, including Wisconsin, have a full ban on abortion, that there's only exceptions made for the if the life of the of the pregnant person is in jeopardy. Um, and then Georgia, a six week ban and then others uh, 15 to between 15 and 20 week bans. Uh, you'll notice here that as we were talking about that access is related to where you live. Right. Um, so if you live in Wisconsin, there's a total ban, but we're going to see in a moment that the state of Minnesota and the state of Illinois have um, full access to abortion. And so for somebody who lives in Wisconsin, that it's, you know, it's still very difficult, you know, to get an abortion. Um, however, it doesn't pose the same difficulties as somebody who lives in Mississippi or Arkansas, where all most of the states that are surrounding them have significant bans on abortion. These are the states where the ban is blocked. And so in these states, there is an abortion ban on the books, but for a variety of legal reasons, it's working it, the, in these states. The question is working its way through the state courts to determine whether or not um, those um, bans on abortion can actually be enacted. So we'll have to see what happens in those states. And just as 13 states have full bans on abortion, 13 states have full access to abortion, and those are the ones in the green. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, you can see here that Minnesota and Illinois, um, the states closest to us, have full legal access to abortion. So in conclusion, it really remains to be seen what the future of abortion policy um, uh, it holds, what the future for abortion policy and abortion access, how that's going to unfold. Uh, this is the first time in U.S. history where a conferred right has been taken away. So we're sort of in unchartered territory. Obviously, there's a lot of confusion over the status of medically necessary abortions. And so, uh, you know, when when there's a lot of confusion among um, uh, doctors, uh, you know, when deciding, trying to figure out, well, uh, I feel like my patient's life is in jeopardy. Is it really in jeopardy? If I perform an abortion, uh, does that mean that I could be criminally liable? So there's really a chilling effect, particularly in states like abortion or Wisconsin that have full bans. Uh, there's also confusion regarding traveling to states uh, and access to medical abortion. Uh, so right now there aren't any laws in the book prohibiting people from Wisconsin uh, driving and uh, obtaining an abortion in Wisconsin or Illinois, but will that be the law in the future? Uh, and that, uh, that uh, while uh, states like Wisconsin now prohibit access to medical abortion, all abortions for that matter, medical abortion is where you take um, uh, uh, drugs that induce an abortion, it's not a physical ab uh, abortion. Uh, there's some question about whether or not people will be able to obtain FDA approved medicine through the mail. Um, it's confusion about the impact that these um, laws in states that banned or partially ban abortion, the impact that those are going to have on in vitro fertilization, because as we know, in vitro fertilization, oftentimes several um, uh, zygotes or, are, 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 are uh, uh, implanted, fertilized eggs are implanted in the uterus, um, and oftentimes that not all of those are brought to term, uh, and so there will be some implications uh, for, on that. And and that it remains to be seen what the role of the federal law will be. The chances of amending the Constitution to embed a constitutional right to an abortion, that, that is not likely to happen in the United States, not likely in, in our lifetimes, but we'll see. Um, but that doesn't mean that Congress couldn't pass federal laws. And those
those federal laws could go either way, right? I mean, a federal law if uh, could that uh, could be passed that um, uh, institutes a federal ban on abortion, that would be possible. And on the flip side of that, a federal law could be passed that uh, guarantees a federal um, uh, access to abortion and abortion rights. So it, it's unchartered territory. And um, so, sorry, this lecture is longer than usual. This is, you know, a lot of material to cover, but it's important material. So thanks for hanging in there and I'll talk to you again soon.